we are going into this year hoping that we are as lucky as we have been for the last 20 or 30 years. But in terms of serious preparation and understanding what can happen and looking to see what happened in, say, Bahamas or Dominica, I mean, th those systems were devastation. And it's just a matter of total, complete luck that Barbados does not fall into one. And it's happened in Barbados in the past, and it will happen at some time in the future. I would be very worried if we were to conquer any kind of serious system this year, given the experience from last year, because of the standard that we've set for building over the years. Last year, Barbados was hit by two severe weather systems, a freak storm in June and Hurricane Elsa in July, the first hurricane to directly impact the island since Hurricane Janet in 1955. Over 2,000 houses were damaged as a result. The damage caused by the Category 1 hurricane and freak storm reignited conversation about the country's building code and the state of Barbados's housing stock. With climate disasters becoming more frequent globally and the forecast of an above-average 2022 Atlantic hurricane season, concern grows about the country's ability to withstand these forces and whether Barbados is in a better state of preparedness than it was last year. The president of the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers, Lieutenant Colonel Trevor Brown, says what occurred last year was a key indicator for the need for a national building code that is enforced and that government's attempt last year to address this with legislation has fallen short. Now what has happened is that there's something called the Planning and Development Act, which was actually um, passed last year and it was uh, proclaimed on the 7th of December 2021. And as part of this act, there is going to be a requirement for the building codes to be mandatory so that in order to get permission to build any building in Barbados, it's going to be required that you conform to the building code. As usual, things don't always work out as they plan. What has happened is that the act has been proclaimed, but a significant section of the act, section 44 to be exact, has not been deliberately not been proclaimed because I, get, I think for administrative reasons it seems as though government is the, the, the public service is not yet ready to undertake the requirements of this section of the Act. We were very optimistic when the Planning and Development Act was passed in the House and then proclaimed last year. But as now uh, many months have gone, now this is now six months since December last year when it, when it was proclaimed, and the progress has been I mean, really, really slow. We, we really were hoping that once it was proclaimed that there would be an accelerated uh, move by government to actually get this in place, to, to actually start people with building the attitude of, of adhering to these codes and, and doing things properly and investing in the future when it comes to infrastructure. And if you understand how the building codes are done, so you get a group of people who actually understand, who've been building houses for years, who actually understand the theory. The, the, the structural engineers and those, they, they actually understand all the forces that play on this. And they sit down and drop this code to say, look, if you were to use this size wood and you put and you were to brace it this way and you were to build the structure this way, this will withstand 140 miles per hour or 150 miles per hour. So therefore what you have is a clear guideline as to what a safe house could look like. He praised government for its efforts in repairing and rebuilding houses damaged by Hurricane Elsa and the freak storm and noted that he sees no real issue with the much talked about prefabricated steel frame houses from China, which have been touted for their resilience to storms. Government has to be commended for the approach that they've taken to try to help well, everyone. I mean, it is, you have to admire a government that takes the responsibility for replacing every house of everyone that is damaged. I really don't know where else in the world a government would undertake that responsibility. So that is commendable. Um, as to how you go about doing it, then obviously we can talk about all kinds of things. First of all, there's, there really is nothing wrong with, this, uh, with the steel frame building. In fact, in Bar we've, been, we've had those in Barbados for, for actually quite a long time. I remember in Hoyts Village, for example, me, as many as 30 years ago, I remember seeing similar houses to that being, being constructed and they're still there. So, that, uh, and, and, and in fact, as you would expect, a metal frame house is actually quite sturdy. It is, um, if it is well taken care of, it's quite reliable and it will last quite long. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we had concerns about why this is not something that we could be doing Barbados and create employment and build on the technology so that maybe it's something that we can actually develop as a technology that we can export. Since last year, 
An increasing number of Barbadians have been showing interest in steel frame houses, which are designed to withstand up to Category 3 storms. I visited one of these houses being constructed at Lower Burnie St. Michael, where I met contractor and general manager of Light Gauge Solutions, Philip Alsop, who explained the benefits of these types of houses. We are in a uh, society where we are, have been accustomed to either you build a brick or you build a wood, but not metal. But this way of building has been around for over 40 years throughout the international market. So we saw fit to adapt it to ours because of the benefits. The benefits being that it could withstand seismic activity, it could withstand up to Category 3 hurricane, and as you can look around and see, it's all mechanically connected. It's fastened to the, the slab and foundation via the Samsung brackets which are a superior grade hurricane bracket, and then we go up with the screws. So we can verify the specifications of every screw nut rivet we use. Yeah, we've got manufactured hurricane straps that secure the roof members to the walls, to the foundation, everything working as a unit. So that's how we have gone to independent engineers, both in Miami Dade and in Barbados, and get that verification of category three, which can, which ideally is withstanding a 200 kilometer per hour wind. Have Barbadians been showing interest in this type of house? By far, and the risks are low. And because the risks are low as it relates to bad weather, termites, and fire resistance, obviously there's the, the catch and the bite. Is there a significant cost difference in comparison to this to uh, wood or blocks? Yes. Um, on the international market, wood is on the rise. And the quality of wood that we would have gotten 30, 40 years ago is not the quality of wood we're getting now. So bearing that in mind, we can say that wood is the best product for building for the resistance that we want mm -hmm. in this climate. Mm -hmm. However, metal is. And the price is about I would say between 20 to 30 percent lower than the other uh, building methods. There have been calls for Barbados and the region to design and construct houses and buildings conducive to the environment given the vulnerability to climate change. A different approach to construction, one in which embraces more technology to ensure infrastructure is up to standard even before the start of construction. Alyssa Amor Gibbons, a Barbadian architectural designer who specializes in climate resilient designing and has been a vocal advocate for this on the international stage, has been pushing for this to be done. I think we need to quite frankly overhaul the way in which we design and deliver buildings, not just in Barbados, but in the region. Um, Part of my work process, for example, is delivering projects through building information management, where I literally create a virtual twin of each design in virtual reality to kind of stress test the design. So we can run analyses on the building to see how it's performing in um, different climate conditions, whether we attempt a category five hurricane wind simulation against a home to see how it actually performs against, you know, winds of that speed and strength. Or are we testing for, say, water level rise in the future? Are we testing for the sun being more hot than you would expect? And how does that impact the thermal envelope of the building? And not just waiting to see what happens after you build a building, but doing that in the design process where we can tweak and change and test in real time. And that doesn't have a renowned cost implication to the homeowner or the stakeholder, because I think a lot of the issue we have is not being able to make intelligent design decisions in those critical stages. How confident are you that we can achieve in having this mindset without waiting on another climate or major natural disaster? How do we get in front of this and not be behind the air ball? That's a tough question because I know a lot of it's human nature to wait for crises to, to act. People often think they need a big change to, to prompt movement in any one direction. But I think the pace at which climate change is kind of just exponentially um, becoming an issue, I think we're at the point now where people are no longer ignorant to the fact that, you know, we could be dead tomorrow. 
if if the right system came along, right? It's, it's getting closer and closer to knocking on our door. I mean, you could listen to whatever speeches, seminars you want, watch COP26 is an issue now. And it's not just an issue that people would have thought, oh, 50 years from now, this is like a no thing, right? I think, like I said, we need the, the policy changes. I think we need the even legislative changes. And, I, and in some ways, I think we've started along that journey of writing certain things into our national policy, our energy policy, to ensure that at just an, a level of expectation, this is the standard to what we're going to. We need a mindset shift. I really do. I really think we do. I think the construction industry, not just in Barbados, but across the globe, is is obsolete. If you look at um, manufacturing industry where things are being made by robots, if you look at um, medicinal industry where people are looking towards space to solve some of the the problems in nanotechnologies to help, you know, facilitate the improvement of that industry. And here we are still building with blocks and and timber. What are the opportunities to kind of streamline and make this um, process more efficient? Is there the opportunity to design buildings in the metaverse, in this 3D world, in virtual reality, where we solve all the small problems, all the analyses, all the testing and simulation of the building, so that we have a sense of confidence that when the real world situation hits, we have an understanding of how we are going to be impacted. And we've kind of designed away the uncertainty I think that's the level that we need to, we need to stop playing a guessing game with our ability to survive. <laughs> we need to get innovative and drag that into the design process to make sure that we are making intelligent decisions based on as close to fact as we can. You can't predict mother nature, but you can learn from it. And you can capitalize on machine learning, AI innovative solutions to make sure that we are constantly pushing the boundaries of what it takes to survive on a planet that is changing significantly. She's advising future homeowners to get professional advice when building their homes, regardless of the size. For persons that are now building, I would, I would advocate highly for getting a design professional involved. Even if you think, man, this is just a two-bedroom um, timber structure, man, my, my uncle knows how to build this, great. But something, and I'll give you a perfect example, something as simple as orientating your building correctly to take maximum advantage of the sun path, um, the wind path across your site can significantly change the performance of that house over the course of its lifespan and yours. People, people take for granted the, the kind of impact that just something as simple as building orientation on the site has on the performance of the home. It's a similar sentiment expressed by president of BAPE who says people are usually concerned that building to code may be more expensive, but he advises that in the long run, it will be more beneficial. But when you invest in something like a house, you expect it to last you what? 30, 40, 50 years, and maybe even longer with proper maintenance. So if you can either build a house for $100,000 and say that you've got a really nice cheap house, knowing that two years from now you're going to have to change the roof and then three years out, you know, the whole thing is going to crack up, or you can maybe spend another $5,000 with professional advice, top quality material, with people who know what to look for and what can go wrong. So you spend that, you spend it, okay, so you spend another $5,000. But that house is going to be there for the next 30 years. You don't have to spend a cent. It is going to guarantee the security and safety of your family. And that, as an investment, it is actually going to appreciate in value. So have you <laughs> have you driven up the cost? Mm. So basically, it's a question of education. And, and people need to, to, look, to know that some things need to be looked at in the longer term. So you may spend a little $5 here and save thousands of dollars next year and the year after that. And, the year. and if you get a storm, then it may be life and death.